Hello, real estate mindset community. Welcome to this Thursday's morning live video. Now, real quick, I wanted to recap on the FOMC press conference that was yesterday. Now, Jerome Powell, personally, I think I think the press conference went well. Obviously, Jerome Powell was reading from a script. You guys see him turning his pages and reading off of it. But what I liked about the press conference was is essentially they gave us a more realistic timeline as far as how much longer they're going to continue the rate hikes. So we'll look at that today. Now, some of the things he said that also that I liked, and he always says this, you know, that basically the economy hasn't felt the full effects yet of the quantitative tightening, raising interest rates. He also mentioned that inflation right now is well above their 2% target. I also liked where he mentioned that they don't believe they're going to get to their 2% target until 2026. They also gave us an update on, you know, higher for longer, basically saying that rates are probably going to go up one more time this year. We'll go into the CME Fed watch tool to see what the market is predicting. But this is important. He also mentioned that the rate would probably be what it is right now, 500 to 525 all the way through 2024. So that was a huge thing. Also, I felt that was really interesting about the press conference was of the 19 members that are voting for rate hikes or not, 12 of the members, 12 of the 19 members wanted additional rate hikes. So there's a lot going on. And another thing that he mentioned that I thought was interesting is that they were basically saying they didn't comment on it, but they were watching the government shutdown. That's probably going to happen in two weeks. And I'm going to start there with this video. Uh, then they also mentioned the school loans that are starting in two weeks, the strike on UAW. So in other words, there is a lot of headwinds going on right now. I think that people are starting to realize what's going on. I'm pretty sure that the pain is starting to sink into people. The recession starting to sink into people. And I want to also talk about where are we going to get inventory? Everyone asks, where are we going to get inventory? Where are we going to get inventory? And I'll, I want you all, I want you all to pay attention to a few things. All right. One of the things I want you guys to watch is the long-term rental market. The long-term rental market is this close, this close from having negative year over year rental growth on a national, <clears throat> excuse me, on a national average. So the long-term rental market is getting crushed right now, but also the short-term rental market or STR rental market is getting crushed right now. Institutional investors are now turning to net sellers. I don't know if you guys heard me on that, and I'm going to read an article uh, from the Wall Street Journal on that. But again, institutional investors are selling houses now. They're giving us inventory right now, not taking it. Very interesting. Obviously, buying demand continues to get exhausted. Defaults are up across the board. Builders are still building like crazy, probably trying to take advantage of certain government subsidies. Uh, obviously, commercial real estate meltdown. The government, you know, the government shutdown in September. Either way, you know, on top of all of those things, we're going into the fall and winter months. I think that we're in for a very ugly remaining part of this year. I think that starts in October. We have so many things hitting October as well. But again, where I want to start is let's go into the government shutdown because a lot of people don't realize that there's a potential government shutdown right around the corner. So I'm going to start here. Now, this is a Market Watch article. This came out or was updated yesterday. Government shutdown, analysts warn of perhaps a long one lasting into the winter. So people are saying that we should be more worried about this government shutdown, potential shutdown than the last one. This won't be like a sh the short shutdowns that didn't face the markets. One analyst caution. So I'm just going to read a couple things here. So at least y'all, not you guys, y'all are aware of what is probably, probably going to happen in less than two weeks. All right. A divided Washington keeps looking like it will deliver a partial government shutdown. And analysts, and analysts are sounding more concerned about it this week. So it's catching a lot of people's attention. The reason this is, is uh, this gridlock means a partial government shutdown is very likely. Now, he's saying there's a 70% chance of a shutdown and perhaps as long as one lasting into the winter. Are you, are you kidding me? I thought... So like me, I'm like, wow, didn't we just get through the last government shutdown, potential shutdown? So now they're saying a 70%, this guy is saying a 70% chance of a government shutdown starting into October 1st. And he is concerned that it's going to carry into the winter. 
That's insane. Other analysts are also warning about the potential for a lengthy shutdown after September 30th when the federal government's fiscal year starts. And that is why right there, the fiscal year, actually, it doesn't start in January. It starts October 1st. If there is a shutdown on October 1st, it could be quite long as there is not an action forcing policy catalyst that would force lawmakers to find some common ground and pass a funding measure because they're too busy fighting because that's what politics are. Politics is just doing things to get more votes. I mean, it's so ugly, you guys. The one a politically sensitive deadline is October 13th when paychecks are due to the uniformed military. So we're probably going to go into government shutdown, according to this, October 1st. And as long as they can clean it up and get along by October 13th, basically this is saying things should be okay. But if they don't do it by the 13th, our armed you know, enforcement officers aren't going to get paid, which is really just, that doesn't sound American to me. Now, uh, this can potentially take months to resolve because it involves some pretty wild issues, you guys, like border crossing, Ukraine, uh, defense spending. So there's a lot of stuff going on right here. Again, the immigration crisis, I haven't covered that. I've told you about 20 miles from my house is a whole Ponzi scheme going on where developers like building houses for illegal immigrants, 20 miles from my house, capital, capital in the United States, 20 minutes from my house, illegal immigration. Uh, and I've been there and it's very scary and I refuse to make that video because I have a family and that stuff is just is super frightening to me. Even if the Republican round house is able to advance a short term spending, sorry guys, spending bill, it is viewed as dead on arrival if the Democratic controlled Senate due to the provisions that would cut some spending by 8%. So they're saying basically Republicans want to cut the spending and Democrats are like, no, we're not going to cut spending. So Either way, I just wanted to give you a heads up. We're probably going to enter into another circus show starting October 1st. And October has a lot of things happening. October is going to be so dark, y'all. What do we have happening in October? October 1st, school loans start. October 1st, that's supposed to be when excess savings is gone. October 1st, government shutdown. There are so many economic headwinds, once again, that consumers are going to have no choice but to let it sink in. And when the consumers let that sink in, obviously buying demand is going to be wrecked. The whole fear of missing out will be depleted out of the real estate market, which is exactly what we want. Now, let's start with our housing market and overall market report right now. Starting with the 10-year, y'all, we have a new record. Let me show you. So we have a new record as far as the 10 year and the 10 year tracks the mortgage rates. 10 years is very important to real estate. It's a long term money sitting out. This is insane. I mean, this is so crazy. We're sitting at 4.48%. A lot of people are saying that's going to get to 5%. If that gets to 5%, mortgage rates will be in the 8%, maybe mid to high 8%. But this sucker is probably just going to be going up. This, this is crazy. If, if you guys watch the movement here, there's a lot of money right now being pumped into this. This is absolutely crazy. But the last time we were this high, y'all, I said, y'all, I almost thought it was you guys, was September 1st of 2007. So this is the highest the 10 years been since September 1st, 2007. Think about that. Okay, because what happened in 2007? There was a housing market crash. But anyways, let's, let me show you how this has not yet affected interest rates. Now, if you go and ask to get quoted from a loan officer, as far as what your interest rate would be, it would be much higher than this because what you see here basically has not been updated yet. So once this updates today, it's going to shoot up. It's probably going to shoot up close to a new record. I believe the last record was 7.49 August 20th, I think was the last record. So we're going to get close to that. I don't think we'll break the record for mortgage rates today, but this is certainly going to go up probably to 3 o'clock, 2, 3 p.m. today. So keep your eyes on that. We're sitting at 7.33%. Now, what's interesting is, is how did the market react to the new dot plot? So one of the important things about the FMO, FOMC meeting is the trajectory of the interest rates. Now, the market reads that trajectory and then prices in the expectations of increased interest rates. Part of the way we follow that, and it's completely useless, and the market always gets it wrong, and, and we can't lean on the market, and it always shifts, but regardless, the way that we see what the market's doing is we watch the CME Fed Watch tool, okay? I know a lot of you are sick and tired of looking at this, but 
It's really important to note that the mark, some of the markets understanding what's going on. Some of the market has no idea, but it has shifted. So this has shifted pretty good. And let me tell you what I like. So first of all, what you'll notice is, is there's only a 31%, the market saying 31% likelihood, November rate hike quarter basis point, but look at December. Okay. Because again, inflation is still there. Jerome Powell said inflation's way above the target. There's still more work to do. They will clamp down on the economy and on the housing market from this point forward. Thank God. Because where else is the inflation? You know, we, we got to look at the shelter inflation. I know oil, I know, uh, you know, energy, but anyways, guys, here's December. December is now uh, way higher than November. So for a long time, November had a higher likelihood of a rate hike. It's now shifted to December. And I also want to point out that they're also a little bit pricing in a 50 basis point rate hike in December. Do y'all see that? So they're saying 7.3% chance of a rate hike. Now, what I think this is, is if the housing market continues to heat up now, you know, and explode, inflation goes out of control. But I'm pretty sure they're out of their minds and looking at lagging data because I could tell you the housing market is definitely not going to be keeping up with the pace it was from March to about August. There's no chance of that happening, but I think that's what that is. I think that's what we see here is that what if the housing market remains out of control, the runaway inflation is consistent. So maybe that's what it is, but take a look at everything else. Let me show you guys May because we want the rates to be higher like this through next year's buying seasonality, right? We need to break that seasonality next year. So the longer, the better. Y'all see what I'm saying? Because the more pressure it's going to put on the prices of the houses. Now, here's the really, really cool thing. May has updated. There's now a 78% likelihood that we will have rates where we're at right now or higher. So we're at 78% chance. That is great. And what is also great is June updated to a 63% likelihood of holding rates. But the thing that I love the most, y'all, I said, y'all, okay, yeah, y'all's okay to say. Not you guys, y'all's okay. The thing I love the most is July. July was looking pathetic until the Fed met it again. Uh, it was sitting at like a, I think it was like 26% chance of holding rates, but now the market is pricing in a 46% likelihood that interest rates remain elevated in July. Now, when the Fed came out, they the Fed said all year. So according to the Fed, we're gonna be in December before they really start lowering interest rates. But according to the market, they're like, there's no way the Fed can have rates that high for that long. So again, ask yourself this question. And honestly, here's the problem, y'all. I don't know that we're going to be able to make it that long. I don't know that we're going to be able to make it that long. If something breaks like really bad commercial real estate, the STR, we find out all this inventory comes from short-term rentals, whatever it is, if something breaks, they're going to bail out. And if they start bailing out, interest rates will go down, inflation will go back up, depending on the, what breaks, right? Depending on exactly what happens. So in other words, we need to maintain. As long as we maintain, I think we're okay. So I'm at the point right now where I actually do not want a black swan event to happen. If Because again, I think if a black swan event is going to happen, the government's just going to bail out those rich people again, and we're going to pay the price. So no one should be wishing for a black swan yet. Okay. Let's get into the next year. Let's get into 2024. And by all means, you know, everything on fire, blood on the streets, whatever. But right now we need more of this tightening. We need more of the money being burnt out of this system. We need more permanent, you know, changes in our market. So Anyways, moving on to the amortization schedule, this will be brief, but here's where we're sitting at as far as the amortization schedule. Remember, the higher the interest rate, the less money it actually takes down to, to buy down your amortization schedule five years. So the higher the rate, the easier it is. Isn't that crazy if you think about it? That's how bad these amortization schedules are. But when I put the new interest rate of 7.33%, which it will go up today, we know that on the average loan amount for a 30-year mortgage right here, you're going to be paying a lot more money than you would be wasting in rent probably, but $483,000 in just fees, in just fees. Yeah, just fees. You guys want to go buy a house right now? You want to pay that $483,000 in fees? I don't think so. But take a look at this. Again, the higher your interest rate, the easier it is to pay down your amortization schedule. Now, remember, this can only be done after closing. 
Okay, so you have to close first and then you call the servicer or you call the lender and you say, I want to put additional money towards my principal. You have to tell the lender towards your principal because some of them are sneaky and will take that extra money and just put it in your escrow account. Okay, because remember, banks do not want you paying the loan off early. They do not want that. Banks want to give you a 40 year loan. They want to give you an interest only loan. They want to give you negam loans because they get rich off of you and me. Don't forget that, y'all. I got a super chat. Chris, I appreciate you, man. I'm going to finish this real quick. Now, going back to the amortization schedule, it's only going to take instead of 20000 it's only going to take to go to the five-year mark to save $116,000 to save all this interest right here, first five years, $18,185. So we're all the way. I bet you when interest rates update today, it's going to be under $18,000 to turn your loan into a 25-year loan. Okay, y'all see what I'm saying? Because again, amortization schedules are absolutely horrible, horrible debt. You guys can see here in year 30, only $1,000 goes towards interest. But in year one, $23,000 goes towards interest. Chris, let me throw this up here real quick. Thanks for what you do, brother. Please don't show my super chat. Just wanted, ah, oh, Chris, you know I'm going to show you love, man. You didn't have to do that. I definitely appreciate you guys. I want, you know, you know what I prefer, Chris? I want you to go out in your life and, and just love someone, man. Buy someone coffee behind you. If you go to Starbucks, you probably don't go to Starbucks, but if you do, but regardless, man, I appreciate you. And, and I want to take a minute just real quick. I love the community, the real estate mindset community. You know, it, it, it's such a blessing to be a part of it. Y'all I'm not money motivated. I'm not motivated by money. I need money. I have children. I need to be comfortable. But what I'm motivated with is changing people for the better. To me, that's legacy. Money goes away. Clout goes away. The views, all of that goes away. But when you teach someone something and they change and they turn into a better person, that's my idea of legacy. And that's what I want for all of you. A good teacher makes teachers, not students. A good teacher makes teachers. And I really... So I don't want to get emotional. I get emotional because I work so hard on this and it means so much to me. But anyways, let's keep going here. Thank you for that super chat, brother. Now, take a look at this is crazy. This is the reverse repo market. This is where they store all of their money overnight. This one up. Look at this. So after the CPI report came out, OK, the reverse repo market started going up again. And the reason that is I'm going to pretty much call it right now is the market, at least the banks that are putting their money in the one day treasury, will say are expecting the yields to be higher. So they're not leaving this. They're waiting for the long-term yields to be higher. And that's what I believe is going on right now. Now, remember when the market thought that the Fed was, for some reason, they thought the Fed was done raising rates. Look at all the money that flushed out. A lot of money flushed out of here. But again, Fed came out and said, nah, it's going to be higher for longer. See me, Fed Watch updated. And you guys can see that the money is now going back into the overnight uh, a purchase reverse repo facility. So very, very interesting. And look at what's happened with the five-year break-even inflation. Now, as crazy as this sounds, when you hear Jerome Powell mention that he wants inflation expectations grounded. So you guys may hear him say that. Again, he wants uh, inflation expectations grounded. This is something that he looks at. This is the five-year break-even inflation rate. And this has been going up. It's pretty crazy. In fact, it's only just now going, it went down slightly yesterday, but it went up to 2.3 again. It ended on Tuesday. It's now sitting at 2.27. This is telling us there's more work to be done. But also my, you know, my seven-year-old daughter could tell Jerome Powell that there's more work that needs to be done, specifically in shelter, housing market, inflation, runaway, hello, right? Like that's what we care about. So there's still even the market knows there is still more work that needs to be done. There's going to be more tightening. There's going to be higher rates. That's pretty much a fact. Pending. I see another super chat pending again. What do we not want to happen? We don't want the black swan to happen. The black swan will uh, eventually we want it to happen, but not yet. Okay. Because remember, here's the thing. Think about it. What happened March of this year? And it, and it really hyper sped demand this year. The black swan. We had a black swan this year and it messed everything up. March of 2023, the bank runs. So remember what happened. The bank run, the black swan bank runs. Fed met over the weekend, disrespecting America, in my opinion. And they bailed out the banks. And what did that do? It dropped mortgage rates as well. So not, and not only did it drop mortgage rates, 
the sentiment changed. The Fed put was well and alive again. Consumers were like, nah, this is cool. Think back. I want you all to think back to February of this year. And if you were like me, you remember the, you remember that time. Because in February of 2023, this year, we were all on the news. We were all over the internet waiting for this sucker to crash. And we had so many indicators in February of 2023 that the housing market was going to continue to crash. But unfortunately, we had that black swan. We had a massive injection of liquidity. Interest rates sunk down right in the beginning of home buying season. So that's why I'm trying to tell y'all. We don't really want that black swan to happen yet, right? Eventually, yeah, unless that black swan is like, we get a whole bunch of inventory, <laughs> then by all means, I want a flock of black swans, but I only want the black swans that help the housing market, not the ones that hurt us, like what happened at the beginning of this year. Take a look at this, okay? This is now, um, the trajectory is going in the opposite direction. This is the 10-year and this is the two-year inversion. And now, obviously, it was reinverting. Okay, it was reinverting here and then it kind of plateaued, but it is now at least day over day, it is inverting. Okay, so, and that's actually a pretty decent inversion. That's a seven, six basis point inversion. The reason that is, the reason it shows inversion is, is a, you know, is, is the tenure hasn't caught up yet. I, I think it's tomorrow or the next day, it's going to be less inverted because, and we'll see these interest rates hike. So we don't have the effects of that tenure skyrocketing showing in the data yet. Okay, so it's not in the data yet. It probably will update today and we'll probably see it today. So again, go back to the mortgage rates if you want to see that update. Also go here if you want to see this inversion. So I, I think this is going to be like probably 0.74 or maybe who knows 0.72, but this is going to reinvert at some point today. Now that concludes our housing market update. So now I'm going to talk to you guys about something that is really Oh my gosh, I love this stuff. This is a good one. This is a good one. Um, I'm going to put a new stamp here. Okay. Put a new time stamp here. So we're going to talk now, and you probably have seen this report already. So I'm going to make this very brief, but we're going to look at that Wall Street Journal article. This came out, I think, two days ago. Meet Kevin's done a report on this. George has already done a report on this, but I wanted to talk to you all about this because one of the problems we have in our housing market right now, institutional investors. Okay. They're taking homes, often affordable housing from first time homeowners. So it's important to understand right now that these institutional investors, a lot of them are now giving us inventory, not taking it huge. And also let me pull up. I'm sorry. So sorry. Let me pull up real quick, this super chat, and then I'm going to get started. Um, Danish, appreciate you greeting. Thank you for your insights. Oh my gosh, my focus. That was weird. Thank you for your insights into real estate. Do you think I should sell my multifamily property in South Florida? 650K, fourplex, 1800 a month. Here's the thing with a question like this. I'm missing a lot of information. If I was just like a normal realtor on a normal channel, I would just blurt something out. But there's a lot of information that I'm missing here. Like what's your cash flow? Where's your cash flow at? So because like what's your net cash flow? Now I'm going to tell y'all, not you guys, I'm going to tell y'all this personally. Overall, I don't believe in selling real estate. As a consumer, I don't think we should sell it real estate. There is just so many advantages of owning real estate. I don't think we could sell it, but if I was in an emergency or in a hardship or I was potentially going to go into foreclosure or I needed or I like really needed the money for something like to start a business or something, then I would consider selling. But here's the thing, if that if that bad boy is cash flowing, I don't know that you should sell that. In fact, I don't, maybe you should, it's just, what are you going to do after? Why do you want to sell it? What are you going to do with the money after? Like, are you going to sell it, hold the money, put the money in T-bills and then use that money to invest in real estate? Maybe that's a good idea. I own a house. I converted my primary residence to a rental. Now I, it was a long story. I wasn't planning on doing that, but I did that. And y'all I'm cash flowing gross. I'm sorry, roughly per month, about $1,200. So I get gross. I'm sorry, gross, it's more net is $1,200. I get net $1,200 a month. So if you're a homeowner with a really low interest rate on your house, I'm telling you, we have the ability to offer our houses for under market rent. So I can offer my house being rented out for under market rent because my mortgage is so low. So it just depends on your situation. If you have unfavorable financing, 
right? There's just a lot I don't know. I'm just trying to do the best I can to give you a, a safe answer, right? A safe and realistic answer. Let me get back over here. We're going to go back into this article. Sorry for uh, breaking uh, right there. Now, again, you, you guys have probably already seen this. I'm just going to read a couple snippets here. This is titled, again, the Wall Street Journal. I have a subscription. I think it's like $20 a month. I got this subscription for Nick T because he's like the Fed's mouthpiece. So I just wanted to know what was going on. But America's biggest landlords can't find houses to buy either. Again, you guys have probably already seen this, but I just wanted to highlight a few things. So basically, the institutional investors cannot find houses. And you can see this here. We write hundreds of offers every week at price points that we'd be willing to transact. Okay. But we're striking out quite a bit. So this is saying that even institutional investors, they can't, they can't find houses. They can't find houses right now because they also, everyone needs a re we'll just say reset in the housing market. And Jerome Powell knows this. The Federal Reserve knows this. They're not going to tell us they're going to crash the housing market. But you guys probably noticed he got a little finicky when he started talking about the soft landing. Y'all, they're going to bring us into recession and they will crush our housing market because that's the only way for us to sustain. The other option is, is all of America gets a, what, 60% wage increase to sustain? I don't buy it. You know, I, I, they're going to crash this bad boy. But look at this. The chart on the left of me is the share of institutional investing. This is this is insane. So the portion of U.S. home purchases made by landlords with a thousand or more doors. I didn't know it was this bad, to be honest with you. So look at some of these uh, look at some of these years and some of these quarters. About two point two five over two percent of the houses were sold to institutional investors. That's a lot of houses. But I also want to point out that ever since, you know, quantitative tightening, the interest rates went up, the four, the tenure went to about 4%. Look at how this has plummeted. Okay, so it's plummeting down. So demand is being wrecked for investors. That's good. But let me show you also a couple other things. Before that bulk purchase, Invitation Homes had added just 470 houses in 2023, uh, but it sold 675. So again, net sellers. And here's why. This is the craziest thing of all. Look at the rental home gross yields, okay? <laughs> this is what's so important to understand, okay? So if we invest in treasuries, six month, one month, one day, wherever, we're gonna get over 5% return, okay? These are investors spending hundreds of millions of dollars and look at the returns they're getting. Look at San Francisco. San Francisco, they're getting what, a four, maybe a three and a half, four percent return. So if you're an investor, institutional investor investing in San Francisco, you're losing money more than likely by not investing in treasury. Same thing with Los Angeles. It's under five. All of these cities going up to Raleigh are under five percent, which means, again, it's smarter for investors to put their money into something that's very safe and very liquid that yields an even higher return. And this gray line represents the one-year treasury. You see that? Now, there's a couple cities that are above, like my city of Houston, Detroit, Chicago, New Orleans, Cincinnati, Cleveland, and Pittsburgh. But my goodness, y'all, everyone is starting to feel this. And the reality is that rental rate increases as aggressively as they've been have not kept up with home price appreciation. Think about that. Think about that. Think about that. And this is something that I've been like screaming at the top of my lungs, the PE ratio. Price to earning ratio is out of control. It's unprecedented. It far exceeds the 70s and 80s. It exceeds the, the great financial collapse. Rental, the price and cost of rent has skyrocketed, but home prices have went so high that even with the increased rental costs to tenants, it still doesn't make sense. What does this mean? What does that mean, y'all? What does this mean? Okay. It means that fundamentals are important, <laughs> right? It means fundamentals. If you don't have fundamentals, it's not sustainable. And that's what we're saying. We're going to go into our first video now. Now, our first video is going to give you guys a breakdown of uh, the FOMC meeting. I know I gave you guys a breakdown, but I figured you guys want to listen to some suits as well. Let me put another timestamp here. Thank you, guys. I said you guys, thank you guys so much for being with me this morning. Let me pull this up. And if you all, if y'all can, let me know that the audio is okay. I love you. I hope you enjoy.
Get straight to our first panel now. Opinions are mixed on whether a recession is still in the cards, but uh, they're united, basically, on a rate pause today. Here on set with us is Jamie Cox. He's the managing partner at Harris Financial Group. Good to have you with us. Uh, also joining us is Subhadra Rajapa, head of U.S. rate strategy at Societe Generale, and Mark Zandi, Moody's analytics chief economist. Mark, I'm going to begin with you, because in this panel, I think you are alone in believing, with some degree of certainty that the Fed is likely finished raising interest rates for this cycle. Why are you persuaded that that is the case? Uh, and how does banking and a possible banking crisis and a possible concern about breaks in commercial real estate figuring in to that hypothesis that the Fed is done? Yeah, indeed, uh, I'm I'm confident. You know, I do a lot of forecasting, Tyler, and some things I'm confident in, some not so much. I, here, I'm pretty confident that the Fed has uh, done lots of reasons. Uh, most importantly, inflation is uh, coming in. It's moving in the right direction. All the trend lines look really good here. Uh, you know, obviously, this recent run up in oil prices could be a risk, but you know, uh, barring that, I think inflation will be back to their target more or less by this time next year, and that does not require any more rate hikes by the Fed. Second. The economy's throttling back. Job growth is slowing. Businesses are cutting back hours. Uh, and most importantly, the labor market, which is tight, is easing up. Wage growth is moderating, very consistent with their their forecast. And then finally, uh, as you point out, the banking system, it's still very fragile. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it, it's uh, stable because of all the policy response back in, in March. But it's shaken. Uh, the, the operating environment for the banking system is very or, and if the Fed keeps on raising interest rates, I think that would uh, you know, do the banking system and, and the broader economy unnecessarily so, given that inflation is coming in and the economy is moderating. So everything points to no more rate hikes. Subhadra, it seems for the markets like a lot of this comes down to that dot plot that Tyler and Steve were just talking about. And specifically right now, there's about four cuts, four quarter point cuts priced in for next year. A lot of people are saying, you know, if we get fewer cuts, uh, expect bond yields to shoot higher. If it kind of stays where it is, then maybe people keep buying the 10 years like they've been doing since we hit 437 earlier today. Yeah, that's that's uh, absolutely how I view it as well. I completely agree with Mark's views on uh, the Fed being done for this cycle, the rates market is really priced to perfection. You're looking at the market pricing in maybe a 50% probability of another hike by the end of the year uh, at the December meeting, and then for three, maybe three to four cuts for next year. So the, given the fact that the market's really priced to perfection to the Fed's dot plot, I think any surprise you get on the dot plot, whether it is to perhaps more uh, cuts, I mean, more cuts for next year or less cuts uh, for next year, I think the market's going to, is really positioned to, to move in either direction. So we'll be really watching the dots uh, closely in the rates market more than anything else. We still think that the Fed is done. I think if they keep policy restrictive and, and keep it at these current levels, I really don't see, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the bond market and bond yields rising meaningfully from here. So we'll really be looking towards the dot plot to, plot to see, to get a first read on what the Fed is thinking for next year. All righty. So that is our first video. Let me bring us now into an article from Market Watch that's going to briefly go into soft landings and how uh, soft landings is probably not going to happen. But Thought this was a cool article. This I think came out last night, I believe. But soft landings are rare for the Fed. Crash landings are more likely, and that's one of the things I was trying to tell y'all when Jerome Powell was talking about like soft landings. And it, and it was funny. A reporter misquoted him, and he got a little upset about that. But he was all over the place and basically implying that hey, he don't have control. There may be a crash landing. That's what I heard, anyways. And honestly, I think that that's what, exactly what they're trying to do in the housing market because the overwhelming inflation. But since World War II, the Fed has achieved a so-called SAF landing just one time. And that was, I believe, when inflation was under 5%. Inflation was well above 5%. And anytime inflation has been above 5%, they have never been able to get a soft landing. But they did get a soft landing uh, mid-1990s. Okay, Every other time the Fed has embarked on a rate rising cycle, the economy has crashed. So again, why so much foolish optimism? 
literally all why is there just so much of this false optimism i mean this is it's, history is just repeating itself once again obviously it rhymes it's not exactly but why so higher borrowing costs depress consumer spending and business investment which in turn leads to rising layoffs that reduces spending even further until a recession results and really that's what we're saying unemployment becoming unhinged is something that will that's going to drastically affect the housing market Remember, un the unemployment rate generally tracks mortgage defaults. So if unemployment gets to, say, 6%, maybe in the next year, odds are the default rates for mortgages will also hit around 6%, which will lead to, obviously, either short sales. I suspect more short sales um, than foreclosures because of the cost of foreclosing. But we'll start to see that, obviously, here very, very soon. We're going to go into our second video now. Hopefully I'm making some good time. The second video is going to go into a little bit um, on the listings of houses and how this, I like this video actually, this is a really good video because it's going to go into the fact that we actually may get listings in the winter and fall months, which means I have about, mm, I would say what, three months, about three months in a week to get another 200,000 active listings to get my bet. I betted with Johnny and Jeff and Vital that we're gonna have a million active listings by year end. So this video is gonna go into the fact that actually we may actually get there. So let's pay attention to this. And the reason we'll get there is because obviously uh, buying demand is wrecked, completely uh, wrecked and home buyers, I'm sorry, homeowners right now are getting crushed as well. So hope you guys enjoy this video. Let me know that the audio is okay. It's at their lowest level since June of 2020. Obviously that's in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, today we have the Fed decision. Does the Fed decision have any impact on the housing market? Does the commentary from the Fed have any impact on the housing market? I do believe the commentary is very key right now. Real yields are high enough for them where they feel more comfortable. But if they let the bond market kind of get out of hand, you know, the housing market, which is existing home sales are near 21st century lows already, can get worse. Uh, so I'm not in the Fed pivot camp. So I think that their comments will really give you their outlook on what they want to see from the housing market. And I think having depressed sale levels is still in their interest. So it'll be interesting to see their commentary on the housing market today. All right, Logan, always love to have you here because you come with the charts and you come with the data. I wanna talk to you about new listings and the trends that you're seeing there. Um, so the new listing trends still below what we saw over the last two years, but even though we're at multi-decade highs of mortgages, not really dipping considerably lower, kind of holding steady over the last few months. How should we read that? How should consumers read it and how should investors read that? There, there is one positive trend with the new listings data, even though it's trending at the lowest levels ever, it hasn't taken another leg lower, even with mortgage rates above 7% with some time now. Real quick, okay, I just wanted to point out, do y'all see the green line, okay? The gr <laughs> do y'all see the green line? <sighs> I'm going to get my, I'm telling y'all, I'm going to get my dollar from Jeff. I'm going to get my dollar from Vital. Look at the green line there. That's, that's active inventory. Do you see that trajectory? Like that skyrocketing up trajectory? I just wanted to point that out. Okay. I'll continue. Sorry. Oh, so hopefully we've created a bottom in this because as always, most sellers are buyers as well. So we need the new listings data to form a bottom and start increasing to get the housing market back to something that we would consider normal. All right, so you say we need the bottom. So are we at the bottom right now? Uh, Diana I, would say, I, I would say, no, yes. I would say yes. I would say that we are, we are forming a bottom. We, we've tested this new listings data for uh, many months right now. We're not seeing another like uh, lower, um, higher mortgage rates are creating. Okay, so to recap, I don't know how much, you know, y'all picked that up, but an inventory bottom is what I heard. So. What if we're at the bottom now of inventory and inventory is only going to go up from here? Because that's what's happening, right? I mean, that's happening right now. Inventory is going up. It's actually skyrocketing. And if we think about it, it makes sense because look at how much existing home golden hand, golden handcuff people are on the sideline. I'm just saying, y'all, this, this, and, and that, that is just existing homes, by the way, that we're not talking about long-term invest, uh, institutional investors, we're not talking about STRs. We got a lot happening right now weakness in pricing, uh, but it's still three to 4% uh, below what we saw last year in terms of uh, percentage of price cuts. All right, we have Diana Olk on the show all the time. She says, generally, 
when the rates fall back below 7%, people run in to go buy houses. When they go back above 7%, people stop doing it. Right now, it's 7.3. Um, if we're at the bottom, what does it mean that rates are still above 7%? Do we just stay at the bottom? Do we bounce off the bottom, even though these rates are back above 7 You know, with new listings growth, uh, since most sellers are buyers, we can trend higher from here. Uh, the question is, does the job loss recession force uh, the new listings data to increase in a bad way? And naturally, that tends to be the case. Yes. Uh, so far, jobless claims have stayed low enough to prevent that from happening. But at some point in the future, you will start to see new listings growth from stressed sellers. That's That hasn't been the case for uh, the last 13 months. But if the job loss recession is on the horizon, then the data will increase for the wrong reason. All right. So y'all heard it. You know, Polly D is not sounding as bullish about the housing market. In fact, all of those bulls that we've been having to listen to for the last five months and super cringe are now starting to turn around. And real quick, I just wanted to say boom, 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 boom. Okay. So Jay, there's going to be no crash, but so all you guys in the comments, don't pick on people that say this. We don't have to and I'm not saying Jay is, Jay's part of our community, but we want to, and I know that I sometimes get petty, but we want to respond in a pot of positive light. We don't have to be like these trolls. So all I would say to Jay is, is and this is what he said here, because a couple of people were kind of kind of digging on him a little bit. He's buying a second house at 5.3. I mean, I hope he does well. You know what I mean? I don't want him to be hurt. We don't want people to be hurt. We want people that if they have to purchase, because we don't know why people purchase right now, but if they are purchasing, like find a great deal with wedge and cash flow, right? So, it, but the thing is, it's really, really hard to find that. And honestly, what's a good deal today may not be a good deal a year from now. But we don't want people like Jay to get hurt. We we want people to do well. So I just I just wanted to point that out, y'all. Show him some love. We we don't have to hate. We don't have to hate. Um, sorry. I know you guys didn't sign up for any lectures today, but let me show you all one other thing. I'm going to go into core logic real quick, and I want to show you the rate buy downs. So here's a chart. Okay, this is demonstrating the buy down share of mortgages. The reason I'm bringing this up is it's not working anymore. Okay, buying demand is exhausted. These insanely low interest rates that Lennar specifically is offering, which is four and a quarter, it's not working anymore. Look at the share of buy downs. It's plummeting. And y'all may think, oh, it's because they have leverage. No, they don't. It's not because they have leverage. It's because they have to offer fixed rates now. They're offering fixed rates because the buy downs are trash. Everyone knows the buy downs are trash. It's not, it's not a real payment. They literally only put money in an escrow account, probably like seven grand in an escrow account. And the escrow account helps pay people's mortgages. It's not even a real buy down. This temporary buy down is nonsense. But look at the share. Plummeting, y'all. Plummeting because it's no longer working just like the the cash flow is no longer working for institutional investors and why is that it's because the price okay we understand interest rates but it's because of the price you the prices are exhausted i'm trying to tell you you got to look at the pe ratios you look at the price to earning ratios it's just not going to work because locals and normal americans we, we can't we can't even if we wanted to prop up the housing market, we can't even afford to. We don't even have the ability to save. We're drowning in debt right now. Things are way harder, whether we go to the gas station or the grocery store. Things are getting really bad. And that's why this whole time I've been yelling at you guys, screaming at you guys, get out of consumer debt, please, while we can right now. Save your money while we can right now. Become an expert in your local housing market, right? When we were on the sideline, I've been on the sideline for two years and I hate it. I hate it, but I haven't been lazy. I've been improving my purchasing power and I hope you guys have been doing that with me. Let's now do our last video. I'm going to save a value, a consumer value for the end, which is going to be credit. Our next video is going to go into the commercial real estate meltdown. So there's a definitely a commercial real estate meltdown that's happening. And we're going to hear a little bit about that right now. See this question in a lot of different places. Wall Street Journal article, other networks. Are we looking at a doom loop in commercial real estate? And that's a doom loop that would involve a lot of small and regional banks going down at the same time. Maybe one of the biggest threats to the economy, at least potentially. Joining me now, Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful, chairman of O'Leary Ventures, Shark Tank investors, and author of The Cold Hard Truth on Business, Money, and Life. I always love the money and life 
Kevin O'Leary. Welcome back to the show. So you have mentioned this in our appearances and our discussions in recent months. Better, worse, commercial real estate, doom loop, bringing regional banks down with it. What is your latest assessment, please? Well, it hasn't improved, Larry. I started talking about this with you about nine months ago when it first showed up on my radar screen because I've got so many companies that bank at regional banks that are small businesses, family-owned businesses in America, now 40 of them. And so what's unique about this situation, and I'll just lay it out, um, many of these are office spaces that are in sub-grade markets. In other words, B markets, double B markets. But even in cities like Boston, you find lots of vacancies, uh, you know, up to 40% of buildings. And the, the challenge is, in every other real estate cycle, when you have a correction, which is about to happen here because of rising rates, and we've got to refinance these buildings, and many of them have no equity left in them, so these banks are going to fail because up to 40% of their portfolio, I'm talking regional banks here, are in commercial real estate. Mm. But here's what's unique, that it's just coming onto the radar screen. Most of these cannot be used again as office because the economy has changed. No one saw this coming, but up to 40% of people that work in small businesses don't return to offices anymore. So we have to repurpose this. You have to take an old office and turn it into a climate controlled storage or a condominium. But in cities like New York, where it's decimated in those double B buildings, they're just empty. You can't do that without zoning changes and policy there is very difficult. So it may be better long term, and we haven't talked about this, but to actually tear these buildings down mm. and rebuild mm. new purpose, data centers, industrial, climate controlled storage, that's where we have to do it. But Who's going to pay for it? Mm. That's what the question is, because we're talking about a trillion dollars in aggregate here. So there's big problems, and it's going to ma manifest itself in these regionals over the next 36 months. So who's going to pay for it? And also, Kevin, who's going to loan money for payment of it? <laughs> well, that is a really interesting question, Larry, because there's two issues there. Number one is most of these buildings were built over the last 30 years at interest rates of less than 4%, many 3%, seven-year mortgages, five-year mortgages, or worse, floating rate mortgages. And now the Fed has raised rates to a 5.5% terminal rate, which means these mortgages are going to be refinanced at 9 to 11%, so a 3x cost. So many of these buildings won't be economically viable. But the, 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 the spinoff, which is causing chaos right now, is those loan books and those regional banks, remember we have 4,100 4, regional banks, mm. have closed to small business because they have capital call requirements put on them because of the pressure on this commercial real estate. So they're not making loans. And even worse, Larry, yesterday the IRS canceled any more refunds for 90 days on the employee retention credit mm. for small business. And there was billions about to be sent out to these small businesses. Good. And as far as I know, it's the only active program that businesses can get capital right now from the government. Why'd they and do they shut it down. Why'd they do that, Kevin? I wasn't even aware of that. why they do that? No. R real quick. I, oh, let me remove this comment real quick. Thank you for that. And I'll, I'll respond. But I wanted y'all to see the banner. Do y'all see this where it says real estate crash could cost banks $250 billion? Do you see how the bulls are starting to come around, starting to be a little bit more realistic instead of foolishly, optim you know, foolishly optimistic? Again, we shouldn't be surprised. I've been trying to cover this you know, as like, transparent and closely as possible. Again, I was off on the demand coming back this year. But when I ask why and we really you know, take a look at it, it you know, look at the bailout. Y'all, you know, look at the black swan. That really happened. It's not like it didn't happen. It really happened. They're preparing for it. It's starting to sink in. Let's, uh, sorry for pausing. It's almost over. Oh, it, what was they the did logic? It because they're con the concern of fraud in the program. And I would tell everybody that every government program that involves an application has fraud in it. But 90 plus percent of the people that apply for this are good men and women in small businesses in America. Maybe it's as high as 95%. And so the IRS, because they're concerned, and I understand their concern for the 5% or whatever it is that are filing these fraudulent claims, they shut the whole thing down for three months. Now you can, I guarantee you in Congress over the next few weeks, the senators that know about this program and their constituencies are going to be calling the IRS saying, why did you do this? Mm. We were about to, I've, I've got over 800 of my companies have applied for this. 
over half of them received their money. In some cases, it saved them. They mm. got 600000 mm. back when they couldn't get any money from a regional bank. Yep. Boost Oxygen is one of them. Snarky T is another one. These are companies never heard of, but they're alive because of the employer retention credit. These programs are not aligned. They're not in sync. So we've got the pressure of the regional banks, commercial real estate collapse, mm. and small business not getting any capital. This is all bad news, Larry. Wow. Y'all remember when he was just sounding like an ag just he was just aggressive. You know, he's a great now he's like everyone's going to people are going out of business. Uh, lenders can't lend to small businesses. Everything is basically going to H E L L. So thank God that I didn't buy a house personally. And thank God that I've been saving my money, increasing my purchasing power. And honestly, the biggest thing of all, thank God I made it through like March to August. That was a hard time. You know, this, this last five months, it was a hard time. Now I'm going to go into our, I'm going to go into the Q and A's. I'm going to answer this question. I'm going to end on credit. I want you guys to stick around on credit. I'm going to show you some tips and tricks, but I wanted to uh, throw this up on here. Thank you for the super chat, uh, Denise. You now what is she saying? I think it's she, if you're not, I'm super sorry. I have just dys this dyslexia. Sorry. You can't prepare for a crisis when you're in it. And, um, so I, you know, I look at that comment like a two things. She's right. You can't prepare for a crisis when you're in it if you didn't see it coming because you, it's already hit you. And that's what happened to me in 2009. Think about what I'm saying. I was an industry professional and it took me till 2009 to understand the house market was crashing. Okay. So we can't, so what I'm telling you guys, we can't lean on realtors and loan officers. I'm saying it for a reason. So she's right. If people keep their heads in the sand and they're not preparing, they're not understanding, they want to stay in their bubble, then they can't prepare because it's going to be at their doorsteps, but it's not at our doorsteps yet. And so because it's not at our doorsteps yet, we can absolutely prepare for hard times. And that's what we've been doing, I hope, for the last year and a half. How do we do that? Get completely out of consumer debt, rearrange how you spend your money, save as much money as possible, work as many jobs as you can and have a correct mindset. Don't get emotional. Don't fall into the fear of missing out, which by the way, are the real doom and gloomers. Did people forget about that? How strong that fear of missing out was? I didn't forget about it. But anyways, I really appreciate that comment. I'm not sure how you meant it exactly, but I definitely... I definitely appreciate it. Now, let's go into credit. Let me throw this up here real quick. Okay, I have to log back in because it times out. So I'm going to pull up something called a what if scenario because I just want to go over one more time how credit works because it's very easy to increase your credit score if you understand how it works. Now, the most important thing, the number one most important thing when it comes to your credit is don't be late. Okay. Do, so that's the number one thing. So we're going to assume everyone knows that already. All right. So then the question is, is, well, okay, I'm not going to be late. How do I get my credit score up? Now, remember me preaching to you forever. I feel like it's been forever. You got to play the credit card games. Credit cards is the only debt that has utilization ratio. Utilization ratio is a special, special formula that's used to give you guys and me credit score increases. And Credit card debt is the only thing that has that utilization ratio. We want to be, I see that super chat. Um, okay. Okay. I see that. I see that threw me off there. That super chat threw me off there. I'm sorry about that. Um, I really appreciate that, but this is really important. Utilization ratio only pertains to credit cards, not car loans, not school loans, not personal loans. It's the credit card game. But if you don't play that game, right? Like Dave, you, then Dave Ramsey was right this whole time then just don't get credit card debt. But if you're responsible and you know how to use your credit cards, you need to play this game. And I have five credit cards. I found that's optimal. I spend most of my purchases on one credit card because I get two, $300 cash back a month. I pay the bill. I'm sorry. I pay the credit card before it bills because whatever's on the bill is reported to the bureaus. So remember, if you max out your credit card, just pay it down before it bills. So I'm going to pull up a what if scenario. This is a what if scenario. This is so we don't have to guess anymore. I want to show you guys and I'm going to prove you guys to you guys what I'm saying. Now, this is analyzing a person's credit. Okay. So this is a credit profile. This person has it. And this is fake, by the way. I've had my credit provider ha uh, make this for me. This is a, co a consumer with a 663 credit score. 
Now, the first thing is, is all of these debt here, all of these trade lines are credit cards or revolving debt. And also the only type of debt that has this, see this here, that's utilization ratio. See that? See that percentage there? Just so you guys know what I'm saying is the truth. You see it? That's the only debt that has that. It is so important to understand the credit card game. Most people don't know that. Now, first, let me show you a late payment. Remember I said the most important thing is not being late or having any derogatory. Let me show you one late payment. Your, your score goes from 663. This person's score goes from 663 to 577 with just one late payment. You cannot be late on your credit cards. It doesn't matter the payment. Now, what if we pay all of these credit cards down? See how this is way over 30%, all of them are? So let's pay it all down, $10. Let's just leave a dollar balance, okay? Dollar balance, dollar balance. So this person's score had a bigger change than a late payment by just paying their credit cards the right way. Do you see what I'm trying to teach you guys? They don't want you to know this, why? Because if you know this, you're not going to pay fees and interest. They don't want you to know this, but you need to know this. You have to know this because the higher your credit, the better deal you get. If you have low credit, especially with credit tightening, you guys will get so fined. You guys will get so penalized. They take advantage of anyone that has a hardship. It's called risks. Any, the more risky you are, the more they're going to charge you. So it's even, it's, it's just a horrible situation, but look at this y'all from 663 to 742. And all they did was pay their credit cards down before they build. I don't care if they charge them back up again, as long as it's paid down before it bills, you guys get the optimal credit score increase. And that's what I want you to have because as we go, again, we're not in a crisis yet. We still have the opportunity to improve our situation. As we go into further into this year, that credit tightening happening, right? It doesn't matter if homes go down 30% if we can't get a loan. Do you see what I'm saying? All right. That's what happened to me back in 2010, 2011. I saw so many houses and it was really depressing that I could buy for pennies on the dollar. Problem was I couldn't qualify for a loan. I had a bankruptcy foreclosure or repo. So I was, I was forced on the sideline. It was really, really sad. Anyways, so that is that. Let me switch over here. We're going to end with some. I can't believe that I did not timestamp the credit part of the video, but I did not timestamp the credit part of the video because I suck. Oh my gosh. It's like my favorite part of the video. All right, well, let's, let's do some questions that I starred. I think someone gave me a super chat. Let me throw that super chat up here. Really appreciate y'all sticking with me. Oh, Charles. <laughs> Charles, uh, I saw your comment on Saks Realty. Yes, your arms do intimidate me. That was real. I was being sincere about that. I have been working out, by the way, and doing ice baths, but my arms still don't look like that, sir. But at least I have hair, all right? You're making me insecure. I'm sorry for attacking like that. Brother, I appreciate you. Good. Stop handing out free money. And see, this is what really upsets me so much. And I tell you all the time, it changed my soul. What happened in March, they bailed out the, the ultra rich. We had to pay for that. And if you look at Silicon Valley, Look, look at the depositors. They're all they're like corporations and rich people. Like Roku, I think had five hundred million. They bailed out the ultra rich, not you and I. The more that they bail out, the more that that wage gap, you know, the the wealth gap, and and the more inflation goes up, and the more we have to pay for it. It's really bad. This is really really bad. Thank you, brother, for your support. I I love you, man. I'm just kind of picking on you because you can handle it. With arms like that, you can handle it. I'm jealous, man. I'm going to increase my weight today. But anyways, let me throw up some of these comments. Very, very good comments. Americans have spent 90% of the excess savings uh, from the pandemic. This will not end well. That's what I was trying to tell you. It's anticipated that all of that excess savings is flushed out of the system in uh, two weeks. People are spending like crazy maniacs right now. Good comment. TW says, BlackRock has acquired a distressed real estate fund. That's a Fiat dollars that we'll have to that they will have to spend before uh, we get to hard currency sell. So um, I'm not I'm not sure what I was going to say about that. I completely forgot. But interesting comment. Appreciate it. That insight. Unfortunately, with elections next year, the government won't let anything go down. I've thought about that, Israel. I've thought about that a lot. The thing is, is there's just going to come to a point, Israel, where they have no choice. I mean, they've been propping up the they've been propping up the market this whole time. The more that they do that, like it's on weaker foundation because it's natural to have the bust. Boom, bust. That's natural. 
there's nothing wrong with it. Well, there is something wrong with it. But the thing is, is, but I do agree, Israel. I am worried about that. I'm worried about more propping up and more manipulation of data. We've already seen it. I mean, it's just, it's just psycho. It's just psycho, you guys. The revisions as well, the revisions are out of control. So I am worried about that. Let's keep an eye on that and I'll be covering it. Here's a comment from Christy. Crazy because rents are going down here, but but I don't see um, how many cash flow with tax assessments. So the reason I'm bringing her comment up is I told you all in the beginning of this video, long-term rental market is almost as uh, almost at a nationwide decline. It's like this close, but in Austin right now, and I think that's where Christy's from in Austin right now, rents already down year over year right now. I think it's down Christy 2.5% year over year. And that's in Austin. And I think there's another four metro areas with negative year over year decline. It is happening. It is happening. The, the question is, is are you going to be ready for it? And I hope you are. And I hope I am right. We, we don't, I mean, eh. anyways, here's another comment right here. 43% of investors are in T-bills, not real estate. And that's what I was trying to show y'all with these institutional investors. There's no way they're going to institutional investors want to buy undervalued houses, <laughs> not overvalued houses. They want us to buy overvalued houses that we can't afford. So we go into foreclosure so they can buy it under market value. And you want to know what else? They want you to lose hope. And I looked at the psychology back in 2009, and I'm going to talk to you guys about, so, and this is another red flag I don't talk about. I looked at a survey about like online searches about the housing market crash. The searches for the, for like housing market crash during the great financial collapse peaked in 2007, right before the crash, say 2009, the end of 2008, the term housing market crash was like record low. So the less people looked and were trying to become aware of the housing market crash, the more likely it was crashing. Do y'all do y'all see what I'm saying? And that's exactly what's happened right now. And I believe that happens is because people lose hope and they stop caring. And that's the only thing that I can think of, but that's happened right now. You guys can see it on channels across YouTube and on articles on the news. They have suppressed housing market crash right on the doorsteps. Okay. Now, obviously it's important to know your local metro area, right? Like Miami's off the charts. Austin's <laughs> melting down two separate, two separate metros. You know, there's, there's, there's separate factors that are going into that the stability of the housing market. So understand those things. And you should understand a lot more of that by watching these videos. Great comment. Thank you. Ryan's comment. Households will likely need to max out their credit cards as they can't obtain more credit. And another thing about that, Ryan, that's what happened to me in 2009, because remember, I told you not only did I have a foreclosure, I had a bankruptcy, chapter seven, uh, really ruined my life. I, I can't tell you how horrible that was for me. It, people are like, oh, Travis, you just, you just, chapter seven, you just walked away from your debt. Yeah, I did. But yeah, yeah. But I was chained to my bad decision for nine years and I paid horrible prices as far as fees, but this is what's going to happen. And looking back at my situation back in 2009, what I should have done is bailed out sooner. I should have sold my house because I it was too I couldn't afford it. My payment was five thousand dollars, and I was 23 years old. I was a 23 year old with a five thousand dollar mortgage payment. Uh, so when you know the mortgage industry collapsed, that was my income, and I lost everything. So when I lost my income, what did I start doing to pay my bills? Started using my credit cards. And that is a vicious, horrible, horrible cycle to get in. If you use your credit cards to live, you got to do something about that. You, you know, f find somewhere else to live that's cheaper. It's just, it's just really bad. It, it leads to bankruptcy. So just understand that credit card debt is really horrible. And if you're using credit card debt to survive, you, you, you probably should try to figure out something because that ends poorly. It happened to me. Okay, next, next comment from Cruz. Some might refinance to a higher rate for cash out home equity stability by switching to an adjustable rate mortgage to a fixed rate mortgage or after a major credit improvement, uncommon but worth considering. So refinances for cash out, Cruz, went up 13% in one week. One week, 13%. Everything is, everything is falling apart right now. So I hope you guys like trusted me in this entire time. You've been increasing your purchasing power because it's not much longer. It's not much longer. People are this, refinances went up 13% in one week. That's so bad. That's an ATM machine. You go from a low rate to a high rate. 
<sighs> that's not sustainable. I really appreciate you guys being with me. Some great comments. Do y'all see why I love the community so much? Look at how smart these people are. I mean, they so much great angles. I hope you guys are loving each other. From Mike, I want to buy a new house, but I'm in the middle of uh, renting, I think. Do I rent my house or do I take cash? And what's my next move? Mike, that depends on you. I think he's asking whether or not he should sell his house or if he should convert his house to a rental. It depends on so many things. You leave so many things out. I, I would need to know cash flow. I need to know payments. I would need to know what you want to do because those are the personal things. Those are your personal goals. But I could tell you in my situation, I chose to rent instead of get the cash. The reason I did that is, is because I'm not in consumer debt. I'm not in, you know, I'm not drowning and I have money saved. I have liquidity. So I didn't need to sell my house and I, and therefore I couldn't really use that money to make more money because I'm cash flowing and I'm cash flowing really, really good. My cash flow on that house, I think is like, it's, it's, it's really good. You know, it, it was a situation to where I had to move. So it wasn't like I was purchased the house to convert. It, 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 was, it was the way it is. It is what it is. Anyways. So this is from Sid Lucius. I appreciate your comment, sir. He's saying cash is trash, buy an asset. And honestly, normally that's really accurate. Now, Sid, would you consider a treasury an asset since we're getting back 5.5% annualized? Uh, and would you also consider that an asset being that San Francisco has a cap rate lower than 4% or right around 4%? So the reason I brought this up is we don't want to get – this changes. I believe right now cash is king. And as credit continues to tighten and interest rates get higher, cash is harder to get. And the harder that cash is to get, the more cash is king. However, it's generally a good idea to use your cash to get money back. That's what the big wigs do. And, and, and we can really easily do that with uh, T-bills. That's what I'm doing with my money. So I don't have just, in fact, I have very little cash. I have pretty much all of my money tied up in either uh, treasuries or gold. And it's only a little bit of gold, by the way. I'm not selling gold. Um, next question. Travis, what's the plan for people that are currently underwater? Tough it out or sell? Well, the problem is, brother, if they're underwater, they can't sell. You see what I'm saying? Now, if, and this is a question to recent homeowners, because we know 10 million Americans are upside down in their house. There's only so many things you can do. A few things you could do if you're upside down is you can short sell, ruining your credit for probably four years. Another thing you can foreclose, again, ruining your credit for about four years, four to eight years, depending on the lender and depending on the loan program. But... If you want to keep your house and you're struggling, if it was me and I was going through this, what I'm doing is I'm calling up the servicing department and I'm talking about a loan modification. That is one of the things that I did not do in 2009. The, the two weeks after I knew, two weeks after I knew I couldn't pay my mortgage payment, I left my house. Two weeks after I was done. So, but looking back, I wish I would have went through a loan modification. That, that was really a bad decision on my end back in the day, but I was like, I can't afford it. I lost everything. I'm a failure. You can have the house back. Here's the keys. So if it's me, I'm going to just depending on my situation, as long as I have my job, I'm going to try to tough it out. I'm going to try to do a loan modification. I don't think one thing I'm not going to do is do a cash out refinance, just depending on the debt that I'm in and restructuring. It's just really tricky. I'm getting my real estate license during this time. I hope to have it all set by next spring. And I just want to say, Jeremiah, you should be proud of yourself. There's a lot of advantages of doing that. Here's a good one right here from Nikki. Nikki, it's nice to see you. If 30% is a crash, it's not even uh, enough for the market to be back to normal. And I wanted to bring this up, Nikki, because that's not entirely true. Understand that if we take a $500,000 house, say that goes up 40%, all we need is it to decrease 28%. Remember that. So yeah, it went up 40% but it only takes 28% for it to go back to that normal. So if we get 30%, Nikki, woo, if we get 30% on a nationwide average, <laughs> we're going to be pre-pandemic. I hope it gets there. I hope it gets there. Here's a comment from Charles. Um, thank you for the super chat. Again, I, I already, I already uh, pulled this up. Here's one. Oh my gosh. You guys did a few, you guys did uh, several more um, super chats. Thank you guys. I'm, I'm seeing these super chats now. Uh, President Potato will bail them out again. I hope not, Jay. Jay, again, I don't agree with, with a lot of the things you're saying, but I don't think we need to be enemies. I don't think we need to argue. In fact, I think we can grow together and become sharper. I value you know, differences of opinion because I ask myself, why? You always help me say, why? Why is Jay saying that? Well, he's probably saying that because they just bailed out the banks in March of 2023. 
they just did it six months ago. So you can't blame him. Thank you so much for the super chat. The crisis is more likely to begin outside of the U.S. And it already has in China. China has lost. What was it called? Country grand or sorry, it was called country something, right? They've lost 60 percent in value on those on those um, sky rises. China right now. And, and here's the thing. China's melting down. And we know that China hides information. China doesn't want to appear to the world that they're struggling. So imagine how much worse it actually is than what we understand. China is in bad shape. Oh, Charles, Charles, thank you for the super chat. You can attack my hair. Maybe one day I'll come down and show you how to bulk. <laughs> I hope so, Charles. I'll take you up on that. Man, I've been working out every day, you guys. It's been so good for my mindset. I've been working out doing ice baths. I suggest you guys do it. It has helped me so much. I was too wrapped up in the housing market. I was too wrapped up in the data. So I started doing things to help me. Anthony, thank you so much. My mortgage payment is $317. Interest rate 0.85%. Maybe he's got seller financing. I don't know, but that is amazing. That is, I don't know what your loan amount is. So I don't know if that's a good payment. I need to know your loan amount. But if your interest rate is less than a percent, that is shocking. That is shocking. So that's going to do it for us today. Happy Thursday. Thank you guys so much for your love for, for those super chats. I think I went into every single one. Country Garden. It was called Country Garden. Uh, yes. So Evergrande is, is another one. Country Garden is a separate developer. They have multiple developers melting down. Other than that, I'm going to let you guys go. I want you guys to have a great day. Let me just end by saying, you know, let's end by understanding how important our credit is and also understand how easy it is to develop a good credit score. You really just play the credit card game. And you, if you have to charge it up, charge it up, but just pay it down before it bills and you'll have an optimal credit score increase. And the last thing I want to say is I am extremely proud of each and every one of you. I am so proud of the community that we've all put together. It's not just me. I'm just the guy up here trying not to say, Y'all, I'm trying not to say, hey, you guys, I'm trying to do the best I can. I'm not always right. It's more than just me. It's about you. So thank you. Let's keep growing the community. You guys have a great Thursday. Love some people. And if you're out there investing in real estate, you guys already know I wish you luck. And I hope you win.